Stephen Elabo. Welcome me to Deeper Life Bible Church Ministry, Charlottesville, United States. It is our belief that you will listen to our general superintendent, Pastor W.F. Kumuyi, and other ministers of God from our ministry, and they are sharing the mind of God with you and your family. God bless you and remain blessed. I welcome you to our worship service uh, this morning. And I pray the Lord will touch every life and turn every one of us around in Jesus' name. And for those who are coming for the first time, we are glad you are here. And we want you to keep coming so that the blessings of the Lord will be abundant in every life in Jesus' name. We're coming to 1 Samuel chapter 4. I'm going to read some verses of scripture relating to the ark of the Lord. The ark of the Lord was very important to the children of Israel, and the knowledge of it is very important for us today. It's called the ark of the Lord. It's also called the ark of God. It's called the ark of testimony, and it's called the ark of the covenant. So wherever you see that, you will know that he's talking about this uh, special representation of the Almighty God, representing His power, His presence, His provision, His protection, as well as its guidance. We're coming to 1 Samuel chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 17. In verse 17 it says, And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there has been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons, also of Naya and Phinehas, are dead. And this is what broke um, the backbone of everyone in the land of Israel. We're looking at that last part now. And the ark of God is taken. The ark of God taken from the people of God in Israel. Look at verse 21. In verse 21 it says, And she named the child Ichabod, saying, the glory of the glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken. That makes you to understand the mind of the children of Israel, men and women, old and young. When they lost the ark of God, the ark of the testimony, or the ark of the covenant, the ark of the Lord, they knew that the glory had departed from Israel. Look at verse 22. And she said, the glory is departed from Israel. For the ark of God is taken. In chapter 6, we're reading from verse 21. It says, And he sent the messengers to the inhabitants of Kedet Jerim, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye, come ye down and fetch it up to you. Eventually, the Lord tormented and punished the Gentiles that seized the ark because it represented his presence. They were thinking their gods had overcome the God of Israel. That's the reason why the ark was taken. But now the ark returned eventually. But when it returned, it didn't actually return to the right place. It took quite some time. We're looking at chapter 7, chapter 7. Verses 1 and 2, and the men of Kedjerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and besought it and brought it rather into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. Come to verse 2, and it came to pass while the ark abode in Kedjerim that the time was long. For it was, how many years there? Twenty years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Lamented after the Lord. In what sense? Lamented after the ark of the Lord. They wanted the ark of the Lord back in their nation again. And back in their proper place because that represented the Lord for them. That represented the presence, the power, the protection the provision of the Lord for them. It was at the time of David, Second Samuel now, chapter 6, that eventually the ark returned 
to the right place. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 9. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 9. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? What at that point is, they tried to bring the ark back to the right place. That is to Zion, that is to the place where David was, to Jerusalem. But they did it the wrong way. Because of that, those who touched the ark, two of them, they were smitten dead immediately. And because of that, David became afraid. And he said, how will I bring the ark of the Lord unto me? That leads us to verse 10. So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David. But David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the uh, Gittite. In verse 11, and the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord did what? Blessed obeyed Edom and all his household. You'll see that even though it was a problem for the Gentiles, the Philistines, and the people, Israelites, and even the Levites of Beshemesh that touched their to are curiously looking into the ark yet, but those who have the right attitude and the right perception and they had the right uh, mind to worship the Lord. And then to honor the Lord as they held the ark in the proper way. The blessings of the Lord came upon them. And so eventually when David saw that the blessing of God came upon the house of Obed-Edom, he decided he was going to bring the ark now to the place it ought to be in the tabernacle. Verse 17. And he brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place. And in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord with great sacrifices and with great joy. They now brought the ark back. Today we're looking at recovering the lost privileges of God's ark. The lost privileges of God's ark. In the case of the children of Israel, there were privileges attached to the Ark of the Covenant, to the Ark of God, to the Ark of the Lord. Privileges that when they lost those privileges was a great, great loss to them. And then for us today, what does the Ark symbolize? And where is the Ark today? And how do we relate to God as we study about what is revealed in the Old Testament and the New Testament to concerning the Ark of the Lord, the Ark of God, the Ark of Covenant, and the Ark of the Testimony. We're looking at this, recovering the lost privileges of God's Ark in three subtitles. Number one, recognizing the significance of God's Ark in the congregation. By the congregation, we mean the commonwealth of the children of Israel. By that would mean uh, the nation of Israel, the people of God, to which, uh, uh, to whom he gave the ark originally, the uh, significance of that ark to that congregation, recognizing the significance of God's ark in the congregation. Number two, reflecting on the superiority of God's ark in Christ. Now that we come to Christ and we have the new covenant, what does the ark symbolize? And what does the ark represent? And what's the superiority of uh, us believing today uh, to them of those days, reflecting, thinking on, meditating on, and believing to you, and acting on the superiority of God's ark in Christ? Number three, recovering the supernatural in God's ark through consecration. Recovering. I want to recover the superiority as well as the supernatural power that goes along with the representation of that ark now in the new covenant recovering the supernatural in God's ark through consecration. We're coming to number one. What's number one with you there? Recognizing the significance of God's ark in the congregation, really in that congregation with the children of Israel. Why was it significant to them? And what did the ark 
you in their midst at that time. And why were, they, why were they so sorrowful when the Ark of the Covenant was lost? Why did Eli just bent over and uh, he bent over and he killed, he, he died just because of hearing that the Ark was gone? And why did that um, daughter-in-law of Eli say, this is like about the child that was born because it was at the time when the Ark was lost. Let's see the significance of God's Ark to the children of Israel, to the congregation of the children of Israel. We're looking at uh, Numbers chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10, we're reading from verse 33. It says in verse 33, And it departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in three days' journey. Listen to this. To search out a resting place for them. To search out a resting place for them. The ark represented the almighty God. His might, his mercy, his power. His direction, his guardians for them. And when they were coming out of the land of Egypt, even they were first of all led by the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. Eventually the Lord said, Build an ark for me. Exodus chapter 25. And all through there you'll see description of the ark, description of the tabernacle, description of everything they want to do to represent the Almighty God in their midst. And now they had built the ark. And then the priests were to carry the ark. And in God's so way, in a supernatural way, that ark would be directing them because they didn't know their way. In fact, they said they had not gone this journey before. Just like you have not gone this journey of life before. Every day is new. Every event is new. You might think, I know about that. I've gone through that before. But when you come through a new day, you discover that you need a new guidance to direct you in the right place. So for the children of Israel, the ark will guide them. And as it guided them, it guided them to search out a resting place for them. A resting place in two senses. Number one, on the journey. Instead of just walking and walking and walking, they'll get tired and it will search a place for them. Millions of people where they'll get water and get enough land and get everything. They didn't know where those things were. And so temporarily they'll search out the resting places for them. And then the final resting place where they will be. It was going in that direction just like in what we studied today. That those uh, milk, those cows, and uh, you see how they went, and they just went to the right direction because a supernatural hand, because a supernatural mind, and because a supernatural light was guiding them. The same thing for these children of Israel, and it goes on to say in verse 34 and the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day. And they went out of the camp. And it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord. And you can see the way the, those things were used interchangeably. The ark of the Lord and the Lord himself. As the ark then went forward, Moses would say, Lord, rise up and let thine enemies be scattered. Because the enemies of the children of Israel were the enemies of God. They oppose the children of God because they oppose God himself. And so when they accept forward, God gave indication. Through that act, it's time to rise up. Through that cloud, it's time to get up. And it's time to move on. And the direction they were to go, the act will lead them. And then the enemies before them will be scattered just like enemies before you will be scattered. And let them that hate thee flee before thee. As the ark was coming, the power of God was coming. The might of God was coming. And somehow, though some believers knew that's God coming, and they knew what he had done in the land of Egypt, and they knew that by the coming of this ark, he could do much more in their midst, and those enemies will flee away. Your enemies will flee away. And when he trusted, that is when the, it wasn't like, uh, you know, Moses deciding we have to stop now. Aaron decided we have to stop now. No, the clouds will rest. And then the ark will rest. When he trusted, he said, return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. Welcome to Joshua chapter 3. Eventually, 
they were led to the borders of the land of promise, that is, to the borders of Canaan. And then you will see again the, the importance of the ark or the significance of God's art in the midst of the people. Joshua chapter 3, we're looking at it from verse 13. And it shall come to pass as soon as the souls of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that came down from above. And they shall stand upon a heap. Now they came to the borders of, of the land of promise. And remember, the final place of rest for them was the land of Canaan, the land of promise. And the ark, remember, was to guide them to that land of rest and that land of promise. But there was a river, River Jordan, overflowing its banks that uh, stopped, would have stopped them from getting to that place of rest. But as long as the ark was with them, as long as the presence and the power of the Lord was with them, and the guidance of the ark they were following, there was no impossibility before them. Looks like we're getting to a point in your life now when you understand who Christ is, what the cross means for you. There will be no impossibility for you. Every door will be open. All the rivers will part. Because it is not by the power, by the ingenuity of those priests. It's just the ark. And once the presence of the ark is there, all hindrances are cleared out of you in Jesus' name. And as you look at this in verse 14, And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priest bearing the ark of the covenant before the people. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priest that, had, that bear the ark were ditched in the brim of the water, for Jordan overflowed all its banks all the time of the harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon and heap very far from the city uh, from the city Adam that uh, it, that is beside Zaritan and those that came down toward the sea of the plain even the salt sea failed and were cut off and the people what did they do and the people I said and the people and somebody is passing over today. Yeah. And the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over. Give me a good amen there. Yeah. On dry ground. You see, that's why it was very important to them that they had that ark of the covenant and all the people passed over clean over Jordan. I see you passing over. Yeah. Difficulties will melt away. Yeah. Those closed doors will open in Jesus' name. You see, there was no sweating, there was no struggle. Once they understood, and the presence of the Lord was there with them. Once the presence of the Lord is here with us, all things are possible. All the things we're looking at, as we were, we're thinking, that would be a blockage, that would be a hindrance, that would be a stronghold, that would be this or that. Everything will clear over and will pass over in Jesus' name. After they passed over, now they faced another challenge. The challenge they faced was the city of Jericho. Because the city of Jericho was walled around. There was no way they could enter it. And yet, that was the gateway to the promised land. That was the, that was the major city that they must, they must overcome. And they must confront before they will get to the promised land. And maybe you have uh, something challenging. You say, if I can overcome this, I know that the rest is simple. If I can go through these gates and these walls can fall down, I know that I'll be able to get to that long-awaited promise the Lord has given me. But those walls are coming down. For the children of Israel, how did the walls come down? Look at it again. The significance of God's act in that congregation, for the whole of that congregation. You look at Judges chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 11. 
Judges chapter 6, verse 11. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city, uh, going about it once. And they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning. And the priest took up the ark of the Lord. And seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rare, the rare word came after the ark of the Lord. The priest going on and blowing with the trumpets. You'll see the significance then, the importance then of that ark for the children of Israel. Come to chapter verse 20 now. In verse 20, so the people shouted when the priest blew with the trumpet, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that what happened? I said, What happened? The wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. I want you to see the ease with which, um, you know, the uh, battles were fought, when the ark was there with them, because it was like the presence of God with them. They didn't have to struggle at all. The Lord himself overcame for them. And when they will have the right attitude to the things God has appointed, God will fight our battles for us in Jesus' name. And then eventually, you know the story now, we'll be studying how the ark had been taken by these uh, Philistines. And then you wonder what's going to happen to the ark. We're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 5. 1 Samuel chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 5. Verse 1. It tells us in uh, chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And the Philistines took the ark of God and they brought it uh, from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And uh, let's look up here for a moment. You know, when you read all these things, you need to uh, think about it in your mind. There was no Levite there now of the ark, or the power of the ark was still there. And there was no priest of the ark, but the power in the ark was still there. Because it's the presence of God, and where God is, whether there is a Levite or not, whether there is a priest or not, it doesn't matter. The power of God will keep on operating. And if Christ is inside you and he lives within you, whether your brother is there or your sister is there or not, it doesn't really matter. Anywhere you are, in the village, in the town, in Ashdod or wherever, you are going to be an overcomer in Jesus' name. You know, sometimes I wonder, I mean, in this situation now, and there is no teacher here, there is no pastor here, there is no prayer warrior here, there is nobody here, but the presence of God is there. The power of God is there, and because of the power, the presence of God, you'll have a testimony in your mouth. And so, we have the Ark of the Covenant there. No priest, no Levite, no worship, no reading of Psalms, there's no singing of any song. All those things are good, all those things are wonderful when they're available. A pastor is very good when it's available. Reading of the Bible, wonderful. When you have the chance to do that, singing, beautiful. When you have the chance to do that, and the worship, wonderful. When you have the, the chance to do that, the prayer warriors are great. When you have the chance to have them. But whenever they are not there, Jesus is still there. And the power of God is still there. So you don't have to say, how will I get healed? The presence of Christ will heal you. How do I get delivered? The power of Christ abiding in you there will destroy every work of the devil in Jesus' name. You'll come back to the fellowship. You'll have a testimony in your mouth. Look at verse 3 here now. And when day of Ashdod rose early, in the, early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was falling upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. Give me a good amen. Amen. You know, sometimes you are sleeping and you are just there. You are sleeping and you have had 
this is a terrible place. The people here, they oppress, they attack, and then they might have attack on serpent, or attack on this, or attack on that. While you are sleeping, Jesus is awake inside you. And the power of the Lord is active inside you. They'll just be surprised that although you are asleep, there is something that is working 24 hours of the day, in the day and in the night. You will not be overcome in Jesus' name. And so those people woke up and then it says, Dagon was falling upon his face. Maybe you come from an area where there's occultic power. That's it, where there's evil power. And they threaten you. They say, ah, you've gone to that major city. And then you say, your God has something. This is village. And uh, there's something here. Whether it is dragon or dagon or relative or dagon or dragon, they will all fall in Jesus' name. And they took a dagon and set him in his place again. Look at verse 4. Before we go on. You know, sometimes uh, when... The choker, the ark, you would have thought, ah, uh ah, -uh, the power of God is no more active. That's what people think. You see, it, once a believer sin may stop the activity and may stop the creativity of the power of God, but the power of God is still there. How do we know? Because you see, it was like it was powerless with the children of Israel because of Ophni and Phinehas and because of Eli. It was like God is not working again. There's no creative power. There's no supernatural power. But when Ophni and Phinehas were not there, Eli was not there and Samuel was not even there and the power of God still resting and abiding, resident in that act, when he began to operate, the people knew that God is still alive. Our God is still alive. I said our God is still alive. You know, you just live right and have Christ in you and have faith in you that the Christ in me will pull me over. The Christ in me will take me over. Nothing will conquer you in Jesus' name. Look at verse 4. And when they came, when they arose early on the morrow, in the morning, behold, Dagon was falling upon his face to the ground again before the ark of the Lord and the hedge of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off. I said they were cut off. Those hands will be cut off away from you. Upon the threshold, only the storm of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house stretch on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod until this day. That's a mighty revival there that stopped idol worship. A mighty revival that stopped the worship of Dagon just by the presence of that ark of the Lord. And that's the reason why that ark was very important unto the children of Israel. It was very essential. It was essential to them. And they knew that once the ark of the covenant was there, the power will be there. The protection will be there. And the glory of the Lord will be there too. David recognized that. Solomon recognized that. Everyone in Israel at that time recognized that in 2 Chronicles chapter 6. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, when eventually the temple was built, they now brought um, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant to the Holy of Holies where it ought to be. 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 40. Now, my God, let I beseech thee, thine eyes be open, and let thine, uh, let thine ears be attent attentive unto the prayer that is made in this place. Now therefore arise, O Lord God, unto, the, unto thy resting place. That is, now they created a place uh, which is the Holy of Holies for the ark of the covenant of the Lord. But they knew they were not just doing that for a piece of wood or just a chest. They were doing that for God himself. It is might, it is power to be in their midst. That's why they said, Now therefore arise, O Lord God, unto thy resting place thou, and the ark of thy strength. You see that? The ark of the covenant, so the ark of his strength. The ark of supernatural strength. The ark of strength for signs and wonders. And the ark of strength to protect and preserve the children of Israel. And let thy priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. 
and let thy saints rejoice in goodness. For well, the presence of the Lord, the saints will rejoice. In the goodness of the Lord, the abundance of the Lord will never still cease in your life in Jesus' name. So we learn the significance of that act in the presence of, in the midst of the children of Israel. Number one, the presence of God. The presence of God. And see that presence in the shrine of uh, Dagon destroyed all the power of evil. If there's any power of sorcery working in your life, the presence of God will scatter it today. And if there is anything that's a stumbling block, a stronghold in your life, the presence of the Lord that is there, represented by the ark in the Old Testament, everything will be smashed in Jesus' name. There is no stronghold that can hinder your forward movement, that can hinder your progress. Once the presence of the Lord is there, number two, that are represented the power of God, the power of God. It, for them, it was like a thunder that will shatter everything, dynamite that will blow everything, explode everything away. And you know, Christ is the power of God today. And for the believer, it's wonderful that we have, number one, the presence of God. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. It's also the power of God. And then it's the protection of the Lord. It protects us from all battles and all whatever the armies of the Philistines may try to do. They will not cut short your life. See, for the children of Israel, they knew that once the, the protection of the Lord was there, represented by that act. If you remember when they were defeated in the battle, and they decided they were going to bring the ark in. When the ark came, they shouted, and the Bible said the earth rang again. They shouted that everywhere trembled. Why did they do that? They did that because they knew that normally, ordinarily, the presence of God, the power of God combining together was for their security and their victory. They were going to win the battle until the Philistines said, Woe unto us, because God has appeared before the people, and one of them said, No, quicken yourself and quit you like men and be strong, and let us fight against these Israelites. But they were able to overcome because those Israelites themselves they had they left the way of the Lord. And also, you have seen that days is for guidance. If uh, you know Christ is within you, you'll see that He will guide you in marriage, He will guide you. In profession, he will guide you. Decisions you need to make day to day, he will guide you. In this journey of life, you will not fall. You will not perish in the pitfalls on the journey in Jesus' name. Because of that presence of the ark representing Christ. We come to point number two now. Reflecting on the superiority of God's ark in Christ. Reflecting on the superiority of God's ark in Christ. We come to a new period, a new era. We come to a new dispensation. For them, it was the old covenant. For us now, it is the new covenant. And as uh, we move on, it's like you are crossing from one age to the other, from one period to the other. And you're asking yourself, well, what's going to happen now? And where is the Ark of the Covenant now? What does the Ark do for us right now? Uh, before I come back to the Old Testament, let us look at uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, and I'm reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 9, verse, we're reading from verse 1. In verse 1, it tells us, it says, Then verily, the first covenant and also ordinances of divine service and of a worldly sanctuary. That word worldly there means earthly sanctuary. It means natural sanctuary. It means physical sanctuary. It is, it's coming from the old covenant and it's coming now to the new covenant. And it says there was the arch ordinances of divine services and a worldly, earthly, physical, natural sanctuary in verse 2. For there was a tabernacle made. There was a tabernacle made. And you know that the Ark of the Covenant was always situated both in the Holy of Holies and then it says for the force wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread 
which is called the sanctuary. Then it says, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. That's the holy of holies. It says in that holy of holies, now which had the golden censer and what's that? And the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had the manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. So you have, it is telling us that in the old covenant, you have the tabernacle, and you have the sanctuary, and you have the temple at large, and it says you have the table of showbread, and then you have the golden censer, and then it mentions in particular now, that's where you add the ark of the covenant. But now, you know, he's talking about Christ. He's going to bring Christ, that Christ is superior and Christ is greater. Look at this from verse 11. In verse 11, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come. They were looking forward to the time when Christ will come. To the time when Christ will die on the cross of Calvary. And so now the cross represents for us the body bearer. The cross represents for us everything that crushes our problem. Everything that takes away the power of the enemy. That's why we can come now and whatever burden you have, whatever challenge you have, you can lay it at the foot of the cross. And what the Ark of the Covenant will have done in those days, the cross will do for you today. It will break every yoke. It will destroy the works of the devil. Your sins will be forgiven. You have peace of mind. And then you are going to have victory in every battle of life in Jesus' name. It says, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. You see, uh, there was a tabernacle in the Old Testament, but this one is a greater tabernacle. And it's a more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and cows, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, you see, holy place, holy of holies, and then the other place, the outer court, and it says, having obtained eternal redemption for us. The use of the Ark of the Covenant was temporary, but the blood of Jesus Christ, this one is permanent. And the cross of Jesus, this is permanent. And what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary, this is permanent. It says in verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more? How much more? Look at those words, how much more? If the presence of the Ark of the Covenant would destroy Dagon, how much more? The presence of Christ. If the presence and the power of the, of the Ark of the Covenant would chase the enemies away, how much more? Christ and the cross. If the old covenant with the Ark of the Covenant uh, will uh, guide them in all the places they went, it says how much more, how much more the promises for you today are greater than the Old Testament promises. And the guidance and the provision, the protection, everything we have in the cross today is much, much greater than what you could have in those days. You are a privileged person in Jesus' name. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. As we talk about the passing off of the old covenant and the coming in of the new covenant, the question is, was this hidden to the people of the Old Testament? That the people in the Old Testament think, you know, their own covenant will continue forever and ever. The showbread will continue forever and ever. The table of, uh, you know, showbread will continue forever and ever. That golden pot will continue forever and ever. The uh, Ark of the Covenant will continue forever and ever. What was their understanding? What was the revelation at that time? Let's come to Jeremiah chapter 3. In Jeremiah chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 3, we're looking at it from verse 16. So you will see that 
in their in their mind the new from the writing of the prophets revelation of the prophets the new that that was just the time for the ark of the covenant a better scene was coming and the better scene has now come better promises better covenant better ministry and the better provision better privileges we have now in christ jeremiah chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 16 and it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land notice this word in those days days to come it was referring to the future says the lord they shall no more they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the lord it says the time will pass they will not be thinking again ark of the covenant ark of the covenant and then it goes on to say neither shall it come to mind neither shall they remember it neither shall they visit it shall they visit it neither shall they be shall that be done anymore and remember it says in those days is referring to the future in verse, uh, in verse 17 at that time they shall call jerusalem the throne of the lord that is the lord himself in a greater way in a mightier way will be resident in jerusalem when Jesus came over there, that's greater than the ark being there. And when the Holy Ghost came upon the disciples in Jerusalem, that's greater than the ark being there. And when the Pharisees said, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring the blood of this man upon us, Jerusalem, that was the headquarters of God now operating in the power of the Spirit of God. And that was something greater than the old covenant ark of the, co ark of the covenant. And when it says, uh, abide or tarry in Jerusalem, until ye be a new world, power from on high. Because when that power comes, it will give you something greater, mightier, than what was there originally. And then it says, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it. Do you remember the day of Pentecost? When all those nations were there, and God poured out his Holy Spirit, and he was speaking in languages not a land any time, but in languages of those uh, nations that came. It was a greater time, and that greater time has continued until today. That power of God has continued until today. And the presence of the Lord has continued until this very time. And then it goes on to say, they come to Jerusalem, and it goes on to say, and neither shall they walk anymore in the imagination of their evil heart. In those days, you see, it's referring to a new day, a new future. It says, in those days, the house of Judah shall walk for the house of Israel. It's talking about unity. Do you remember on the day of Pentecost when it says, they were all together with one accord. And then it goes on, the ultimate purpose of God in this new covenant is that all the tribes will be united together. All the people will be united together. And as we come to the new covenant, neither female, neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Gentile, but all one in Christ. And they shall come together out of the land of the north, to the land, uh, to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. And he goes on to tell us it will happen in those days. But remember, when it says in those days, it's referring to a particular period. And that's the period we're living in now. I said, that's the period you are living in now. Jeremiah chapter 31. I'm reading from verse 33. Jeremiah chapter 31. And we're looking at it from verse 33. But they shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. We're coming now to the new covenant. And it's the covenant I'll make with them after the old covenant is gone. And then the era and the period of the ark, the physical ark, the natural ark, the ark you can carry. After that is gone, it says, after those days I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I want you to compare the period of that time with the period of this time. At that time, the law of God was put into the Ark of the Covenant. And the rod of Aaron that bore it, showing the power of God, and the choice of Aaron was put also in that Ark. And the manna was also put in that Ark. But the Lord said, 
the days come when it will not be that ark, I will put my law, not in the ark, where will he put his law? In our very heart. For the children of Israel, the, for the whole nation, the law was inside that ark. But for us now, it's not just in the building. It's in your heart. It's in my heart. It's a heart there. It's in the heart of everyone that believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is also purified and sanctified by the shedding of the blood. And the manna, the manna, they put the manna there, which they were, you know, they had ate for, they had eaten for 40 years. But now Jesus said, Moses gave you that manna in the wilderness, but I am the bread come from heaven. And he gives us that word now, and he gives us himself, and he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's a new era that he has now come to make his tabernacle among us. And then the rod of Aaron that bought him, that showed that Aaron was the accepted high priest. There is a signation that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He died, and he rose again. All the rods of all the other tribes died, and he did not burn. But now this one body edge, which signifies resurrection power of the Lord upon the life of Jesus Christ, that he has approved of him. He has said that this is my son, my only begotten son, in whom I well pleased, and he raised him up from the dead. And that Christ now lives inside us. Christ to you, the hope of glory. And so you see that that era had passed, and now we come to a new era. That's why it says in verse 34, and they shall teach no more. Every man is neighbor, and every man is brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least. He unto, uh, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And uh, now you are wondering when was it physical, demonstrated, physically demonstrated that the ark was no more because now Christ has taken the place. We're coming to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading from verse to, uh, from verse 1 to verse 2. Matthew chapter 24, from verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Remember the temple? You have the temple, you have the outer court, you have the holy place, you have the holy of holies. And it's in the inner sanctuary that you have the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and you have the table there, you have all the other utensils there that they were using in their Jewish worship. And now here is what Jesus said, and Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, the, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. The temple was destroyed. All those uh, utensils and everything, all that uh, taken away. And so that the people will know that era is gone. That time is gone. And so during this period now, we're not talking about the Ark of the Covenant. We're not searching for the Ark of the Covenant. We're not trying to locate the Ark of the Covenant. Does that mean that, uh, you know, God has forgotten about it? He doesn't, you know, know where it is himself? Of course he knows. God knows all things. In Revelation chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 19. Revelation chapter 11, and we're looking at verse 9. The temple of God was opened. Where now? You have not opened your Bible. Revelation 11 verse 19. Are you there now? I said, are you there? Revelation 11 verse 19. And the temple of God was opened where? In heaven. And there was seen in his temple. In his temple. That is the temple in heaven. There was seen in his temple. Tell me what you'll find there. The ark of his testimony. Now it's, you know, in heaven. And it is not here in Jerusalem, it's not in Antioch, it's not in Jordan, it's not anywhere now. That other one is gone. It's gone. And then it says, and the ark of this testimony, 
and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and the earthquake and a great hail. The power is still there. And the power come from heaven to, to, to chase away all your enemies and to destroy anything that goes against you. That ark is there and is represented in Christ and Christ will demolish and destroy every power against your life in Jesus' name. And you need to think about that every time. And don't think that, you know, how unfortunate we are that, you know, we don't have this, we don't have that. Now you have all things. His presence as Emmanuel, God is with you. He says, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. His power is with you. His protection is with you. There's a wall of fire around you. And from today that you know who you are, you know what you have, you know what you can do, and what God can do in you and through you, no power will overcome you anymore in Jesus' name. Oh, we're looking at Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8, and I'm looking at verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8, and we're looking at verse 6. But now, you see, it's a new era, it's a new time, it's a new dispensation, but now I see or obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also is the mediator of a better covenant. The time we are now is better than the time of the Old Testament. Is better than the time of the old covenant, which was established upon better promises. You have better promises now. You can be saved without offering the sacrifice of an animal. You can be saved without a priest being present. You can be saved without going to travel to Jerusalem to get saved. All your sins can be taken away just where you are, either in the church or in your house. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can be sanctified anytime, anywhere. The moment you lift your heart to the Lord, the presence of the Lord is there and it will sanctify you. You can baptize in the Holy Ghost. You will receive power dynamite from heaven, the power of God from heaven, anywhere you are, anytime, it's just for you to open your heart, and then the glory of God will come into you, and that glory, you will not lose that glory anymore in Jesus' name. But looking at it in verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall teach, not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord. You recognize that's what we read in Jeremiah chapter 31, after I said, after those days, or in those days, you will not say anymore the ark of the covenant or the ark of the testimony, but in those days I write my law in their hearts. That's what he's saying here now. Say, know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least, even to the greatest, for I will be merciful unto their righteousness and their sin and their iniquities. I will remember no more. When God forgives you, he forgives you and sets you free. All the guilt of the past, they are gone condemnation of the past, they are gone. All the consequences of the foolish things we said, foolish things we did, everything is totally gone. And God looks at you as if you never committed any single sin in your life. And then you come in the righteousness of Christ and you're bold before the throne of grace and everything you need will be available to you in Jesus' name. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm reading now from verse 17. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. You see, in those days, the ark of the covenant was present with them. And once the ark of the covenant was physically present in their congregation, in Israel, they knew that all their battles could be won. But now it says Christ greater than that ark. Christ mightier than that ark. Christ better than that ark. Now he dwells inside you in your hearts by faith. That ye be rooted and grounded in love. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breast and the length and the depth and the height. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Look at that. There was nothing like that in the Old Testament. 
The ark was not inside them, only a period of time when the ark of the covenant was, uh, was in the house of Obed Edom, and the Lord blessed him. But it's not just in your house physically now, it's right inside your heart. The power is in your heart. His presence is in your heart. His peace is in your heart. And all the protection is all secured there. And the evil one will not touch you in Jesus' name. As a result of that Christ being with us and God being with us and the Holy Spirit being within us. Look at verse 20 now. Unto him that is able. Your God is able. And it's not far away. It's still with you right there. Unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or see according to the power that worketh where? That worketh in us. Now he walks within us. No wonder you are victorious. No wonder you are an overcomer. That power will never fail in your life in Jesus' name. You remember point number one, recognizing the significance of God's act in the congregation, in that congregation. Number two, reflecting on the superiority of God's act in Christ. Number three now, recovering the supernatural in God's act in God's ark through consecration. The children of Israel, they lost the ark, the ark of the covenant, the ark of testimony, the ark of the Lord, the ark of God. They lost that ark. But you know what, um, you know what David did? He made sacrifices. He made offerings to the Lord. He, and in that, at that time, it was the offering of animals. It was the offering of sheep and all those other animals. And then with joy and excitement and absolute surrender, they brought the ark back. If we have lost the presence of Christ, if we have lost the representation of the power of God in our lives, what do we do? How do we bring that power down? Because that power is coming back again. In every heart, the power will come once again. In your family, the power will come once again. In our church, power as of old, it has come. If it has not reached you, it's getting to your place today in Jesus' name. But you see, we have something to do so that that power will come. The power will come. And all the things we, you know, we complain about. And all the things we, uh, you know, shameful, sorrowful about. And the things we're saying, but how about this? How about this? All, all about uh, that will clear away in our lives in Jesus' name. But the Lord has told us what to do. In Joel chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 12. Joel chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 12. Therefore also now, says the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garment. It's saying today is not something physical. We don't roll on the ground. We don't, um, you know, smash on pebbles. We don't um, do anything evil against our body. It says it's our, it's our heart, not our garment. And turn unto the Lord. You have listened to our pastor, Pastor W.F. And I believe the word dwell in your heart. Jesus' name. Let us pray. Our mighty Father, we thank you, Lord, because of the message you have given to us this afternoon. I pray by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ for every year that I'm listening to the word, it will be fruitful in their life in Jesus' name. And by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ, every one of us shall dwell with you in the kingdom of God and the last day. Thank you, O Lord, because you are the Lord that answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray.